I am very pleased to welcome the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, Mauricio Claver Caron, as well as Matt Swift, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Concordia. Matt, welcome to the stage today. Matt, you're on mute. <laughs> now, see, I, not, not, not even I can get it right. Thank you very, very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, President Mauricio Claver Corone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, elected in September of this year, Mauricio Claver Corone has assumed leadership at the IDB at a critical time for economies across Latin America and the Caribbean facing deepening recessions and a daunting uh, pandemic. Uh, President Claver Corone previously served as Senior Director of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council and has held key positions with the IMF and the U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, he also played an important role in the creation of the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, which has been uh, an, a remarkable success, resulting in billions of dollars of annual investments in economies around the world. Uh, I must say that President um, uh, Claver Corone is also a strong advocate for democratic institutions and public-private partnerships, which, of course, is key to Concordia's mission and objective. Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us for the fifth Concordia America Summit. Matt, thanks so much. Appreciate it. I, I wish we can be in uh, Bogota, but we're here uh, virtually uh, doing it from wherever you are, and I'm here in Washington. Absolutely. I'm actually down in South Florida, but uh, but I remember fondly oh, your home. <laughs> of course. But but very, uh, I remember fondly uh, your interview at the fourth Concordia America Summit in Bogota last year when you were still uh, at the National Security Council. So it means a great deal to us that you're back. And uh, the okay. bank has been a, a wonderful collaborator with Concordia. Let's go right into the elephant of the room. You started in September, as I mentioned in your introduction. We have a global pandemic taking place around the world. I would be remiss if I didn't flag that it feels like the global media, the national media here in the US is not talking a lot about the effects of the pandemic on Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank is the leading development finance institution in Latin America and the Caribbean. What is it that the IDB is doing um, at such a critical uh, imperative time? Well, again, Matt, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, for your question. And, and don't call me president anything. I'm, I'm Mauricio and will always be a, a Mauricio. You know, as, as you said, COVID-19, the pandemic really triggered an unprecedented economic and, and social challenges in Latin, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, making the response to the crisis really my top priority as president of the IDB. It's what I campaigned on. Uh, as a result of this crisis, uh, the institution, you know, we're, we're working first and foremost to overcome the immediate challenges related to the pandemic. Uh, from the start, we assisted our member countries in fighting the virus on the ground. We helped them secure, purchase medical equipment uh, and, and other uh, uh, PPEs, everything critical to saving lives. And we also accelerated the pace at which we work to address the pandemic and execute our institutional strategy, which of course provides the roadmap uh, to strengthen our government's economies and businesses so they're better equipped to weather the challenges like uh, the pandemic and to really also look at the opportunities and seize the opportunities that that stem from this time of crisis which there are and they're going to be really important for the recovery uh, hopefully by the end of this year it's likely that we'll have dispersed about 35 percent more to the region than the idb had provided for example in the 2008 2009 during the financial crisis and we've really focused our support along four uh, strategic areas. The first, obviously, public health preparation, strengthening those ministries of, of health and the response capacity so that the countries can contain the virus, they can mitigate impact, they can strengthen public health systems, uh, and, and et cetera. Uh, also, the creation of safety nets for vulnerable populations, uh, policies, programs to support low-income, vulnerable uh, populations has been really important. Um, enhancing economic productivity and employment uh, through small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, providing liquidity, uh, supporting value chains, uh, amongst uh, other things. And then, you know, developing fiscal policies, obviously, to limit the severity and duration of the economic impacts uh, that we see here. Uh, hopefully looking towards the future, uh, we as a group, as the IDB group, which includes IDB Invest, IDB Lab, uh, we can look really focus on, on taking these opportunities and rebuilding uh, stronger uh, economies for the region. Of course, that's gonna require us to look at some of these challenges, including debt, 
uh, because the reality is, and I've said this many times over, we don't want countries to have to choose between saving lives in the short term today and really mm -hmm. foregoing and mortgaging a more prosperous uh, future. So another thing we've done here now is also to formalize a debt negotiation mechanism. Uh, I actually, I just right now in my office, uh, uh, well, in the building was the president of, of, uh, of Honduras, President Hernandez was just here, who obviously has the COVID pandemic. Hurricane uh, Eta, Hurricane Iota, kind of the, the triple uh, whammy. And we were just discussing this. We created a debt uh, a negotiation mechanism, which is being led by our, our vice president for countries, who was recently approved by our board, uh, Richard Martinez, uh, who was the finance minister of Ecuador and led a really successful debt renegotiation there. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, uh, you know, we want to make sure that our, you know, these economies recover, right? And, and yeah. recover in a better way. Uh, so that's what we're looking forward to. Uh, sorry for the long answer. I'll shut up. No, 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 but Mauricio, <laughs> no, no, but Mauricio, this leads me to a question um, in, in, in the sense, has COVID changed things from a, for a permanent, in a permanent way in terms of how the bank uh, is run, how you, how you address these issues? Is there an element? I mean, I think that a lot of these countries in the region are resilient, but, but it, it takes an awful lot of resiliency to get through what we're going through in 2020 alone, and nobody, uh, you know, certainly anticipated something fully like this. I'm right. So, do you see a permanent change in how you'll run the bank going forward um, to be prepared for the next moment like this? Yeah. Well, look, I, I, absolutely. In the sense of, and I ran during the campaign on this. You know, what we need is really uh, to to have. Uh, a, a more agile and more efficient institution. And that's absolutely clear. The other thing we need and what we're looking at is that we need uh, a capital increase. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we need a capital increase is like, let me just give you the, the common sense view here. We have the worst health crisis and ensuing economic crisis in the history of Latin America and the Caribbean. So in the 61 years of this institution, there's never been a worse crisis. Then add to that, you have one of the worst geopolitical crises uh, anywhere in the world, as we see in, uh, in, in, in Venezuela, with the largest migrant crisis anywhere in the world compared to that of Syria, but yet that receives one-tenth, one-tenth yeah. of the international support that that yeah. of Syria has. And then add to that, the region worst affected, this has been the worst a hurricane natural disaster season in 50 years where we have four out of the five countries most affected in the world uh, by natural disasters. Look, our lending capacity is about 12 billion. We know the needs of the region are about 25 billion. We know that just in the health sectors alone, those health sectors uh, need uh, about 150 billion uh, to really fully bring be up to speed. In small, medium-sized businesses, it's about mm -hmm. 85 billion. The, the gap, the largest small, medium-sized business gap of uh, in financing of anywhere in the world is right here in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's about $85 billion. So I, I think what we've seen here is that in order to, to do business and to do it uh, with agility, efficiency, we need to focus on the opportunity. We need to make sure we have the resources necessary to respond. That's what I'm focused on. And, and that is why one of the first things we've done along with all these other things that we've discussed is really uh, present a concept note for a capital increase, uh, mm -hmm. because if not now, when? Um, Got it. And and when do you think you might present sort of that longer term plan for capital increase? Yeah. So the goal here is to be able to present it to governors for governors to agree uh, to a framework at the in Barranquilla in Colombia at the annual meeting, which is to be held in March. Uh, we're having pretty active conversations at the director level. I mean, we're doing so at a, at a pretty uh, uh, spiffy pace here. Uh, I've been already just having discussions uh, with leaders in the in the U.S. Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, to see if they set forth uh, a framework and a guidance. Uh, obviously, there'll be a new administration coming in. We want to be able to work with them uh, and get them up to speed. I think that the new <clears throat> the income administration understands and agrees on the on the needs that the region has in that regards, uh, mm -hmm. and then also what it means for the United States and for U.S. national security and things of the sort. Uh, so I think we're going to have a, a good audience there. Look, in the in the spring, uh, under the CARES Act, there were mm -hmm. capital increases approved for the African Development Bank. There was a replenishment of the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, and there was uh, the, the 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 borrowing arrangements for the IMF. Uh, the IDB was nowhere to be seen, and yet, as I said, it's the worst region in the world mm -hmm. hit by COVID. It has the worst geopolitical crisis, one of the worst and uh, the worst migration crisis uh, in the world in Venezuela, and then obviously the worst hit by natural disasters. Why were we left out? We don't. We need to really catch up uh, because the region needs it. Uh, look. Let me tell you a staggering figure that I just learned yesterday. 
our chief economist yesterday sent me the figure in regards to foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. Last year already, foreign direct, foreign direct investment in Latin America and the Caribbean fell by 7.8%. This year, it's estimated to fall by 50%. That's, that's nearly catastrophic. We need to really... now. We can talk about this later, but opportunities come from that. And yeah. because of the pandemic, that we can make that up. But that needs to be our priority. Those are jobs lost. Those are families hurt. Those are social services not provided. Uh, that's mm -hmm. going to be more informality, more poverty. Uh, you know, we're, we, we need to get to work. Yeah. No, and I think that plays into to, that's a perfect bridge to my next question, which is paint for us a vision of what you see for Latin America and, and Caribbean long term what is it what are some we 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 hosted a great session this morning and a conversation with the president of Colombia Ivan Duque and and he he gave a, a bit of if in one year and five years and 10 years uh this is the kind of growth that I would like to see uh, describe that for Latin America and the Caribbean what what do you want to see over the next five years while you're president of the IDV yeah so listen part of my campaign is I'm committed I committed to only serving 5 years only serving one term and that's one of the things that we're doing different here you know it's been 15 20 year presidencies I'm here 5 years here's the one thing I said during the campaign and I repeat right now I want in 2025 for us to be able to say Latin America did not lose another decade and because it's lost way too many decades and we know yeah. that the other thing I want people to be able to do and this is something kind of at a much more granular level I want people new generations to know how the IDB touches their lives. I want every Latin American to understand, you know, uh, the IDB has somewhat of a stale brand and people know it as like a big infrastructure project and, and you know, kind of these uh, deals with finance ministries, et cetera. What, what, what I want everyone to know, we are so talented in this institution. It's, it's, it has, it is, has the, the greatest human capital of any institution, the knowledge base, everything. I just spoke to you this morning. I was on a, in an anti-corruption conference in Korea. We did a, a human trafficking uh, uh, event that we hosted here at the IDB. We're involved in everything, gender, climate, you name it. I want people to understand everything the IDB does because the new generations in Latin America and the Caribbean don't know how the IDB touches their life. Now, back to your question. 2025, we didn't lose another decade, but how are we going to do that? I want to measure everything here, and we are measuring everything here. We're actually launching a, a jobs plan uh, in that regards by job creation. You know, not only uh, uh, because we see also, by the way, for upper middle income countries, uh, quote unquote, uh, how they are stifled by the old GDP measurements and things of the sort. Job mm -hmm. creation, all about job creation. We're a development bank at the end of the day, but nothing has a greater social, economic development impact on people's and their families than jobs, formal jobs. And as I just told you, with those staggering figures that we saw uh, of a 50% decrease in this year in foreign direct investment in the region, we need to work really, really, really hard to use every tool, every instrument, every facility, every sector of this bank needs to focus on how we help people create jobs, how we help countries create jobs, how we help, how we help private investment, how we do public-private partnerships uh, mm -hmm. in the region uh, in order to create those jobs. Because when you create a job in the region, you know, that's a family that will have some type of, of, of health service. That's, that's, those are governments that are going to be able to have fiscal income uh, and be able to provide uh, social services uh, to, to more people. That's formality. Uh, that's, you know, governance. Uh, that's, it's, uh, it's across the board. So that's what we're focused on. Jobs, 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 formal job creation in mm -hmm. the region. And small, medium-sized businesses obviously play a huge role in that in the region. We can go into all of that as well. No, but you raise such an important point because I think you can't talk about the future of Latin America until you talk about how you address the informal economy. And you think about everything we've gone through here in the United States with COVID-19 this year. And I and I think to countries that has, have 50% of their workforce um, is informal. And you think, my God, how do they address that. So any conversation you're talking about in terms of the ability of these societies to continue to grow has to start with how you address the informal economy and bring people into the formal economy. Um, but if, if, if we can, I'd love to, you brought up public-private partnerships. You also brought up awareness of what the IDB group does. Um, and I think that that's so important. The passage of the BUILD Act and the, um, the new iteration of, of, of Overseas Private Investment Corporation into the Development Finance Corporation, you were a major architect of that. Um, and I think that was a powerful reset to explain to the public 
what the Development Finance Corporation does. So it's great to hear that a big part of your uh, mandate and focus as president of the IDB is to uh, really explain to to groups what the all the different services the IDB offers. So to our business community, Mauricio, what is your call to action in terms of public-private partnerships, collaborations, uh, how you'll fund projects going forward? Okay, so thank you for this question. I love this question. This is going to get to the basis of job creation and everything we want to do. When I was in the National Security Council and uh, of the United States government and the pandemic hit, um, obviously global borders shut down. And when they shut down, a lot of companies panicked. Uh, their supply chains were disrupted. I mean, it was probably the greatest disruption in, in supply chains and in trade that we've seen in, in definitely in modern history, if not in all history. Uh, in that regards, I probably had about 300 U.S. companies call me to try to help them, whether it was in Mexico, some other country uh, in the region, uh, to deal with uh, their supply chain issues. And guess what? They were very successful. The lesson that the U.S. business community learned from uh, this pandemic is that, you know what? It's worth having your supply chains close to home. Because those issues that we had with Mexico, Colombia, other countries in the Caribbean, you know, those were easily resolved. The issues they had in Asia, they were much less successful and they were much more disruptive. So there's a huge momentum shift to this new concept that we call nearshoring. Well, it's not a new concept, but it's actually one that matters now because it's not about political rhetoric and political will talking about integration just, but it's really about corporate will. Companies want to do this. There was a recent study by UBS that said 75% of U.S. companies, manufacturing companies in uh, China are either are either planning to move their facilities or considering it. That's a huge opportunity for the region. Let me tell you what that means. We're actually now going about to put out soon a nearshoring initiative and toolkit. What that means is that it's in the very short term an eighty to one hundred and fifty billion dollar opportunity for Latin America and the Caribbean. If 10%, and this isn't about new imports to the United States, et cetera. If, the, if, if Latin America and the Caribbean just grabbed 10%, 10% of what the U.S. is already importing from Asia, that's nearly $150 billion worth of trade and wow. investment for the region. That's huge. That's jobs. That's in, in the neighborhood where the United States lives for our neighbors, for our borrowing nations here. Those are jobs. Good jobs, formal jobs. Uh, that's good for for it's good for it's a win 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 across the board. And guess what? Companies get that. They're seeing that now. What company? What countries are going to succeed uh, the most in this regards? Look, the countries that have set up private partnership uh, frameworks that are successful that have created. You know, we've pretty much have participated in the creation of just about every in, as the IDB of every investment agency in in the region. For every dollar that a government puts into uh, an investment promotion agency, they get about $40 back uh, in investment. So it's a good investment because they do, this is what they, they spend their time doing. And we're helping them now with this. You know, countries like Colombia, Uruguay, Costa Rica, they're doing a great job. Dominican Republic, uh, Guatemala, they're doing a great job in, in looking for those opportunities to bring in uh, uh, investment, to bring in uh, uh, those that are looking to relocate. Uh, and, and the time is now. So that can't be missed. And the mm -hmm. only way that the region is going to amply recover, not lose another decade, and actually turn the corner and reinvent itself uh, is going to be uh, by, by not letting the train pass it by. And that train is called integration, and that train is called nearshoring. And let me tell you, I have 48 shareholders here, so I work for 48 countries. And some countries don't like it when I talk about nearshoring. They get a little, you know, because they don't, it's not really about a competition thing. They, 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 they say, oh, is this like a geopolitical thing? It has nothing to do with that. It's yeah. really about it's good for its transportation costs. It's good for uh, 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 the environment because you're closer. Uh, it's good for climate for countries that 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 are that are primarily focused on climate. That we all should be uh, focusing on it. You know, it, it's good for development impact in the countries. It's good for governance. You know, yeah. when U.S. companies are invested in the region, they take the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act with them. Yeah. You know, you want to talk about a successful uh, uh, anti-corruption framework? Hey, look at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That's what we can be uh, as well exporting to these countries. Those opportunities exist, and that's going to be the key to recovery. We're fully focused on it. And by the way, you know, and and so you know, with our European and Asian friends that that sometimes don't don't like the nearshoring concept. Here's what I tell them: We're jealous. Sixty-five percent of all European commerce is intra-regional. Fifty-five percent of all Asian commerce is intra-regional. You know what percentage of 
uh, commerce in, in Latin America is intra-regional, intra 15%, 15%, that's it. So we just wanna emulate that success and that opportunity exists. And the United States can help play a big role. The IDB uh, is gonna be the flag bearer of nearshoring because it's gonna benefit those 26 borrowing nations uh, that we have. They're extraordinarily excited about it because that is short-term immediate job creation. By the way, we just saw Ford just just uh, bu uh, is building a new factory in Uruguay. That's 2,000 jobs that they were gonna expand the facility in Turkey. They're gonna expand it. Uh, they're gonna create a new one in, in Uruguay. That's great for, that's, that's 2,000 jobs in Uruguay. That's a big deal. There's a, 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 a similar uh, cellulose investment in Paraguay, 20,000 jobs in Paraguay. That's a game changer in Paraguay. Yeah. This yeah. is what we need to be doing putting those people together. Uh, we just had a meeting of the American Business Dialogue, which is something that we have here at the IDB that we bring in uh, these CEOs. We're gonna be launching this toolkit, an initiative. Uh, we want them to come to the region. We want it to be in 2025, in addition to saying we didn't lose another decade, if people can say, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean is a prime destination for foreign direct investment. Hey, we did something right. Well, uh, we'll have to end it there, but but it couldn't end on a on a better and more poignant point uh, for everything that we're talking about today. Uh, Mauricio, thank you very, very much for coming back to Concordia. Thank you. Um, and it's, it's, we're very excited to work with you on a number of things, hopefully through 2021 and, um, and, and many important, uh, things to come for the region. And I think the final conclusion is pay more attention to our own hemisphere, pay more attention to the Western hemisphere as much as we can. And always remember, if you're about to start a session, you always click and turn off the mute button. So thank you very, very much, Marisa. I really appreciate it. Hey, there's no better place to be here in the region and here with you. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs>